it. Who's to say that there is an edge, and why assume there is one? Is it because when we are introduced to the idea of a flat earth, it's always depicted like this? In the currently most accepted model, Antarctica is not a continent, but a 360 degree land mass made up of ice that holds the oceans within. When we look at a Gleason's map from 1892 that states at the top that it's scientifically and practically correct, as is. We see this Antarctic ice rim the Gleason's map is basically an azimuthal equidistant projection, which can be traced back to the year 1000. The AE map is also an official map of the United States Geological Survey, the USGS, and the official logo for the United Nations. The oldest known globe in the world is from 1492. This is something you need to keep in mind because many people argue that the azimuthal equidistant map is just a flattened out version of the globe, when in fact the globe is just a rounded version of this true world flat map. If the flat map came first and it has the ability to convert into a globe without any problems whatsoever, then that should tell you a little bit about how this globe deception was achieved. Now, back to if there is an edge or not. There is no proof that there is an edge past the Antarctic ice wall, but it is speculated by many that perhaps the plane that we live on is either extremely expansive or it's possibly endless. In these two scenarios, it would be logically assumed that more land is being hidden from the general public. In a 1954 interview with Admiral Richard E. Byrd, an American naval officer who specialized in exploration, he had this to say. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. Implying that there is more land past Antarctica. If that uninhabited land was on a globe, it would be in the Indian Ocean. A recent discovery of an old Buddhist map in a newspaper from 1907 seems to support the idea of a vast plain with much more land. Where does the sun go if the earth is flat? Well, the sun neither rises nor sets, but travels in a clockwise circuit from east to west and only appears to rise and set due to perspective. The sun disappears at the vanishing point of human perspective on the horizon where the ground meets the sky. And since the sun is not 93 million miles away, I repeat, not 93 million miles away, but much closer and smaller, the light emanating from the sun only illuminates about half of the flat plane at once as it makes its daily journey.
What's underneath the flat earth? This is obviously an unanswerable question since the assumed edge has never been known to be reached. But many people suppose that whether the earth is round or flat, that either way, it still must be floating in the middle of outer space. But the idea of outer space goes out the window with the round earth theory. Many religious texts support an immovable earth that has its foundations on which it is laid and its pillars by which it is supported. We simply don't know, but we do know that the earth is obviously fixed in place as we can tell by our everyday experience of non-movement. What we see in the skies above are illuminated objects making circles around us just as it appears. Whatever this place may be, it's the center of all we survey. Some say that the earth is the floor of the universe. In the ancient Hebrew conception of the universe, we are surrounded by the waters above and the waters below, known as the Great Deep. The deepest hole ever drilled into the earth was a total of about seven and a half miles. The very core of the earth is nothing more than wild speculation, if not another malicious lie. So what's under the earth? That remains a mystery to us all. But another thing that you can research is what's inside the earth. Multi-billion dollar deep underground military bases known as DUMBs. D-U-M-Bs, right? What about ships and boats disappearing over the horizon? This is also due to human perspective. They don't go over the horizon, they go into the horizon, moving beyond the limit of our vision and past the vanishing point. But the ships and boats are easily brought back into view with a pair of binoculars, a telescope, and any camera with a good zoom lens. A great question to ask yourself is why can't we see noticeable curvature from 120,000 feet up? But many people claim that the supposed curvature can be seen from the ground by watching boats. It doesn't make sense. And what about all of the pictures of the Earth? They are all clearly computer-generated images. They claim this picture from Apollo 17 in 1972 is real, and they also claim that the 2015 epic Earth picture is real. But NASA employee Robert Simmon gave us a glimpse of how they do it when he shared his experience of creating the Blue Marble 2.0 in 2002. He is now called Mr. Blue Marble, he was interviewed and on record stating, the last time anyone took a photograph from above low earth orbit that showed an entire hemisphere, one side of the globe, was in 1972 during Apollo 17. NASA's Earth Observing System, EOS, satellites were designed to give a checkup of Earth's health. By 2002, we finally had enough data to make a snapshot of the entire Earth, so we did. In 2002, Blue Marble 2.0, NASA's Rob Simmon made this. Simmons' job is... It's primarily taking data and making pictures out of it. That's what this is, a composite of data sets from several different instruments translated into a picture. So we actually had to take clouds out. They stashed the clouds for later, went onto the ocean. That came from an instrument that measures phytoplankton in the sea. Where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it was a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. Then add the clouds back in. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. So some of those are painted on. It is photoshopped, but it's it has to be. Then? There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just take Command-Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. 
what I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. But I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is Photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is Photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is Photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is Photoshopped, but it's it has to be. Why are all the other planets round then? When you compare amateur footage done with professional grade cameras and compare it to NASA's official images of planets and stars, it's clear that NASA images are all computer generated, no different than the photos of Earth. What have become known as planets are round lights that seem to be set over the flat Earth. The so-called planets and stars are not what we have been told they are, and comparing luminous objects that you see in the sky to the Earth under your feet is very ineffective for actually proving the supposed rotundity of the Earth. Since there are no actual photographs of the Earth, and motion has never been experienced or proven, it would seem more logical for one to assume that we are on a flat motionless plane and everything we see in the heavens revolves around us. What about satellites and GPS? As crazy as it may sound, satellites are a hoax. Have you ever wondered why there are never any damaged or fallen satellites? and why there are no satellite malfunctions due to constant heating and cooling. It's weird they don't melt in the thermosphere that's over 2,000 degrees. I find myself looking at the moon and wondering why we never see satellites pass by the moon. Did you know there are thousands of miles of fiber optic cables under the seabed that supplies 90% of the Earth's communication, internet, phones, etc.? And GPS works off of cell phone towers. It's called triangulation. Haven't you seen those really tall towers and wondered what they are? Satellite TV is just enhanced radio using ground-based towers. It's all ground-based, just like the old TV antenna. Science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke proposed the idea of geostationary satellites in 1945 in a magazine called Wireless World. And 20 years later, in 1965, they claim to have successfully launched the first commercial geostationary communication satellite. Today, there are said to be thousands, but the odd thing is that trying to prove it only leaves you fruitless. Is outer space even real? Yes and no. What you see in the sky, as far as stars and wandering stars, also known as planets, are there. How could we deny them? We don't know what they actually are, but they are there. Now what we are told about outer space and what it is, is not true at all. Everything we believe about so-called outer space is due mostly to Hollywood movies and other media, including children's cartoons. Of course, NASA propaganda is the biggest culprit. As we have already gone over, there are no pictures of Earth, and even images of all the other so-called planets are computer-generated. NASA has gone on record numerous times stating that humans can't get past low Earth orbit. NASA's next spacecraft, already being built and tested across America, will do those things and more. This is the spacecraft that's going to take humans to explore uh, the solar system. It's the next big step for NASA in exploration. Called the Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle, or MPCV, this next generation spacecraft will enable America to explore beyond low Earth orbit. 
As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. The plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is, that is much bigger than what we have today, and it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, via, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go, and this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to, and we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. And unlike the previous program, we are setting a course with specific and achievable milestones. Early in the next decade, a set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit is supposedly between 99 and 1,200 miles away. The funny thing is that they say the moon is over 200,000 miles away. How did we make it so far in the 1960s and 70s if we can't do it today? Also, the International Space Station, just like everything else brought to us by NASA, is a fake Freemasonic hoax, completely fabricated and done with special effects models, pools, zero-g planes, and various other camera tricks. How is circumnavigation possible on a flat Earth? Very easily. You can travel east and west directions to ultimately end up right back where you started. The face of the Earth looks similar to that of a clock, in fact, clocks were most likely designed after the true appearance of our world. If you follow a compass east for long enough, you'll make a full circuit. Same thing if you travel west long enough. As we've already gone over, the flat earth map that was around before globes were, easily converts to a globe. So everything you believe you are doing on a globe is actually taking place on a flat earth. How come the moon is upside down in the southern hemisphere? This is another very simple explanation. When somebody is in the northern part of the earth, or on the northern part of the earth, they see the moon from this angle. When somebody is on the southern part of the earth, the moon looks like this. They're looking at it from this angle. They see it from the opposite angle, and that's all it is. Imagine you tape a picture of the moon in the center of your living room, right? Depending on where you are in the room, the moon will be seen differently. When pondering this question, keep in mind that the face of the moon never changes. On a spherical Earth, we'd expect to see other sides, but we never have. What about the seasons? The sun is close and small, and it circles around and above the flat earth in a spiral pattern on the Tropic of Cancer in the northern summer months, and then down in the Tropic of Capricorn in the northern winter months. So when the sun is further away from the North Pole, right, the center of the flat earth, it's winter in the north and summer in the south. Since the sun is smaller than we are told, and closer, it makes much more sense that we experience seasons in the first place. If the sun was 93 million miles away, and had a radius of over 400,000 miles, we would hardly experience temperature fluctuation as we do. What about gravity? Gravity is necessary in order for a spinning ball Earth to work. People readily believe that you can't fall off of a spinning ball that's darting through outer space at speeds that you can't even comprehend, yet they will deny how much easier it is 
to stay on a flat surface that doesn't move. Gravity is a scapegoat for all that cannot be explained, and it has never been proven. The reason why things fall or float is because of density and buoyancy. If something is heavier than air, it falls. If it's lighter than air, it floats. Very straightforward. Your phone is denser than the air, therefore it falls when you drop it. Everything works because of density. No need to factor in imaginary components. Quote, The law of gravitation is said by the advocates of the Newtonian system of astronomy to be the greatest discovery of science and the foundation of the whole of modern astronomy. If, therefore, it can be shown that gravitation is a pure assumption and an imagination of the mind only, that it has no existence outside of the brains of its expounders and advocates, the whole of the hypotheses of this modern so-called science fall to the ground as flat as the surface of the ocean, and this most exact of all sciences, this wonderful feat of the intellect, becomes at once the most ridiculous superstition and the most gigantic imposture to which ignorance and credulity could ever be exposed. Thomas Winship, Zetetic Cosmogony. What about the Coriolis effect? They say that the Coriolis effect is a result of the Earth spinning and is responsible for the deflection of an object moving above the Earth, rightward in the northern hemisphere and leftward in the southern hemisphere. The problem is that things like hurricanes and water in the sink aren't always predictable and have been known to spin both ways in either hemisphere. Also, another contradiction that proves the Coriolis effect false is the fact that no flying machine above the Earth has to account for it. If a bullet that travels 1700 miles per hour has to account for the effect, then an airplane traveling at 550 miles per hour would definitely have to account for the effect. When you look for the answer, you'll find that we are told that since the atmosphere moves with the spin of the Earth, planes aren't affected. So why would bullets be? Especially when they go much faster than common airplanes. Why can't I see infinitely far? This is for the people that wonder why they can't see certain things that they believe they should be able to see if the earth was flat. I've been asked on numerous occasions, why can't I see Mount Everest from anywhere on earth? I've also been asked, why can't I see Spain from the east coast of America? Well, besides dirt, dust, dew, rain, fog, smog, smoke, clouds, mist, haze, snow, etc., your vision is limited by the vanishing point of your perception. Check your weather app on your phone and notice the visibility in your area. Is the flat earth a religious thing? Yes and no. I say this because I myself am not religious. I'd rather not have faith in something, but know the facts to the best of my ability. And the facts are that the curvature and motion of the earth have never been proven. The Bible without any doubt whatsoever supports the earth that's fixed in place. The book of Enoch, which is biblically endorsed and most likely belongs in the Bible, describes the flat stationary enclosed earth in great detail. Many religions and civilizations preceding Judaism and Christianity support a flat and stationary earth, such as the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Norse, the Hindus, etc. This fantastic spinning globe earth is very new to the people of the world, yet most of us carry on as if the theory is unquestionable, and we've been conditioned to laugh when the flat earth is brought up. Whether you are religious or not, you can see the flat earth for yourself. Is the flat earth society behind the resurgence of the flat earth? 
No, the Flat Earth Society is designed as a containment unit. Gatekeepers that tell the truth about some stuff, but then lie about other things in order to make it appear ridiculous or steer you in the wrong direction. For instance, this is what FES has to say about gravity. In the Flat Earth model, gravity, rather than being a force, is the upward acceleration of the Flat Earth. The Earth always accelerates upward at 1g, which is equivalent to the gravitational acceleration in the Round Earth model. Like the force of gravity, the Earth's acceleration causes several commonly observed phenomena in our daily lives. If that isn't the biggest turnoff, I don't know what is. The Flat Earth argument has never died. It only died down. Real Flat Earthers have always been among us. But it wasn't until late 2014, early 2015, when Eric Dubé started making a lot of noise about the Flat Earth conspiracy and got people like myself on board. It took me 10 months of research before finally accepting the truth about where we live. Thanks to the many great Flat Earth researchers, content creators, and activists since then, more and more people are waking up to the massive deception every day. Are all scientists, pilots, and members of the government in on it? No, most scientists, pilots, and members of the government have been indoctrinated just as the rest of us have. When they work at their everyday job, they go about it as if the Earth is most certainly spherical. If indeed some of these people did know the Earth is flat, they most likely wouldn't even speak out about it in fear of losing their job or ruining their reputation. The average scientist goes about everything they do with the spherical Earth already factored in. For mainstream science, questioning our current model is a huge no-no. For pilots, computers do most of their work, not to take away from what they do because I personally appreciate it, and also pilots often switch out at stops making it difficult to understand the real layout of Earth's land masses. As far as government members and politicians go, besides high-ranking officials at NASA, which isn't government at all, it's safe to assume that they are not in the know and they are not knowingly perpetrating this lie. Very few people compared to the population of the world are enlightened to the Flat Earth. NASA isn't the only space agency. Are all others in on it too? The answer is yes. Here's a short clip on what you need to know. The Vector, NASA's official logo. If you've ever looked at NASA's official logo, both their, their official insignia and their official seal, you'll see that the most prominent object in the, in the seal is a, a red swooshing object. They call that the Chevron or the Vector. If you ask NASA's public affairs office, that this symbology is featured so heavily in their insignia and seal, they'll give you what really amounts to the, the standard facile cover story for the unilluminated. They'll tell you that that is uh, a representation of a hypersonic wing design from the 1950s, um, which was the time the logo was created. Um, not exactly the case. Um, someone might want to ask the Russian Federal Space Agency, Roscosmos, that was formed in 1992, why they chose that same logo. And while you're at it, you can go ask the Chinese who formed their space agency in 1996, why in the world they're using a hypersonic wing design from the 1950s as their official logo. Then you can ask the Japanese, the South Koreans, Taiwanese, Malaysia, Mexico, Iran, all of these countries, even Bulgaria. They all utilize the vector symbology in their space agency logos for their, their national space agencies. Um, it gets even deeper. You can go look at the individual manned program patches for NASA. Now, the Mercury program, for example, uh, a blatant use of covert symbology. In every logo dealing with the Mercury program, you'll see what looks like a number seven in their logo. And again, NASA's official story is that they put this number seven there so that they could pay homage to the original seven Mercury astronauts, um, kind of forgetting the fact that only six Mercury astronauts actually flew into space because number seven never never did. Deke Slayton had a heart problem, so he, he didn't get to go up. 
Uh, so there were only six Mercury astronauts, yet there's a seven in every single logo. That's in the official mission and say, or official program insignia for Mercury, as well as the six individual mission patches carry this logo. And it carries on to the space shuttle program. If you look at the Apollo logo, the Apollo logo has a big letter A in it. At least that's what they want you to believe. But it's not. Again, that's just a simple way of explaining away the inclusion of this vector symbology in the logo. If you go to the space shuttle program, uh, the original space shuttle STS program patch is a triangular patch that, again, hides the use of the chevronic vector symbology. And that also goes for many of the STS-specific mission patches. Uh, every single one of the International Space Station expedition patches carry the vector symbology. The Russian Mir Space Station used the vector symbology. That was their, their official logo. And you can even go deeper and look at military industrial complex companies. Look at the logo on a company like Lockheed Martin, two vectors. Um, the XPRIZE logo, Ames Research Labs, U.S. Space Command, when you get into the military realm, the United States Space Command, their official logo is the vector symbol. And when you look at the military's individual space-specific programs, all of them, all of them deal with vector symbology and their official insignias. And the, the question really becomes, who or what are these people paying homage to? Let's look at NASA's Earthrise. Now let's look at JAXA's Earthrise. Do you believe this is real? Well then, who's responsible for this deception? You will find that the Jesuits and the Vatican have been intimately involved in all things space, including owning the earliest telescopes and to this day the largest owners of observatories and telescopes in the world. The Society of Jesuits have been actively spreading the heliocentric theory for 500 years while trying to bury thousands of years of flat earth cosmology. The Jesuits are rulers of all powers that we are aware of and have been ruthless in their pursuit of world domination for centuries, no matter who is killed or what has to be done to establish a one world order out of chaos. They rule over or are deeply partnered with people like the Rothschilds and many other international banksters, secret societies, especially the Freemasons, as well as Zionist Jews, and especially Zionist Jews in seats of power. They rule over all the alphabet agencies and government think tanks, including the NSA, CIA, FBI, Mossad, KGB, Roundtable, Committee of 300, Tavistock Institute, Lucius Trust Publishing, Bilderberg Group, and the Council of Foreign Relations including representative government and legislation like the U.S. Presidency, Congress, and the Supreme Court. The Jesuit order is said to have been established by Jews, again showing that the Jews are behind some of the biggest hoaxes in history, including the Holocaust. Freemasons are also spread out all over the world to further the different agendas that serve this Illuminati elite. Why the lie? Why the fuck you lying? Why you always lying? Oh my God. Stop fucking lying. Always lying to me. You lying so much. You making it hard for me. Their desire is to convince us that we are only one of a septillion other planets flying through infinite space. A septillion? Where do they get these numbers? A septillion has 24 zeros. They want us to think that we are nothing more than a cosmic accident caused by a big bang that took place 14 billion years ago. Again, where do they get these numbers? How one could draw that conclusion is unknown. 
They want us not to understand our origin and go on believing that life is meaningless. They want us to believe that alien life is real and that they created us. Look no further than ancient aliens for the propaganda. Not to mention countless shows and movies they program us with. This isn't just about Flat Earth versus Round Earth. It's much bigger than that. Whatever they plan on doing needed the spherical Earth groundwork laid before they could proceed. They may either shock us with a fake alien invasion, or a disclosure of the beings that have always been among us, passed off as life from distant galaxies. Who knows? Another reason to turn the Earth into a ball is to hide extra land. If this is a vast plain, and there are places past Antarctica, with more oceans and more land masses, then an easy way to get rid of them is to wrap our part of this plane around a ball and make it seem as if there is nothing else and everything has already been discovered. The globe is full-fledged slavery for the inquiring mind. I like to be an explorer, like the Great Magellan. Oh, well, you're too late. There's really nothing left to explore. What does it mean if the Earth is flat? It means that the origin of man is deliberately being covered up from us. Man, woman, child, you are being deceived on a massive scale. Flat Earth, enclosed Flat Earth, expansive plane Flat Earth, or even infinite plane Flat Earth with an infinite ceiling barrier, or possibly another plane of existence above us and below us. It means that this place was created that you were designed, you were crafted, you are special and with purpose. A purpose being hidden from you on purpose. We are supposed to know our world and our reason for being. We've been swallowed whole by this economic fiat money system that controls absolutely everything and fuels this manufactured reality. Most of us know that we are slaves, and it's no wonder we desire to escape through movies, TV shows, and video games that happen to also further our programming and mental conditioning. We were never meant to live like this, and knowledge of our flat earth is a step in the right direction. It's something that can't be taken from us. It's the fuel that we need to let these bastards know that we won't go down in ignorance. We will not willingly accept their one world authority that wants to rule over all mind and all matter. Embrace this flat world of ours and free your mind from the globalist mind control. It's time that we stand up for ourselves and our beautiful earth. All I want to know is who's coming with me.